Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan, and I'm on Spotify. This is one of the places you can find the Block Stars with David Schwartz. I'm telling you, David is really talented. He's multifaceted, and he's bringing superb quality content to everyone in the crypto space. There are two new uploads. One of them is Catherine Coley. She's with Binance US and he had very good questions for her. It's about 39 minutes long and they talked about the Bitcoin having. The impact yeah, could be very different from what we saw in July 2016 because the adoption now is so different. Now she, there, she didn't give any predictions, but she did apply some simple economics to supply and demand and it could lead to hmm, some interesting price action. I think both of them agree that crypto has improved the financial literacy across the world. And I don't think anyone would disagree with that. The second podcast was with Mark Blinder. He is the CEO of icon and it was about making cryptocurrency more environmentally sustainable it was good i very much enjoyed it and he gave a recommendation for a book at the end one that i think i'm going to check out it's called ancillary justice i'm always up for a good book recommendation all right there is a new announcement and that is the facebook libra association announced today the appointment of Stuart Levy as its first CEO. He's going to take this position in the summer after stepping down as the chief legal officer of HSBC Holdings. He served as the first undersecretary of the Treasury for terrorism and financial intelligence during the Bush and Obama administration. I am sure this appointment will be yet another very loud wake-up call for banks and fintech uh, as a whole. So talking about a wake-up call, there was a very good webinar. Uh, this is again another example of things that have come to the virtual world and now so many channels are available of this great content that we can watch. This has the IMF, the CEO of the Digital Dollar Project, Daniel Gorfine, the Central Bank of the Bahamas governor, who they just uh, issued their own central bank digital currency on the retail side, and then Santander's John Whelan. He is the lead in the Finality Project. So thanks to all this working at home business, we've got this event and you can view it on the YouTube channel. This was called the digital finance webinar future of money and it was hosted by the institute of In international finance now from the imf was sonia davidovic i have listened to her on a number of occasions and i can tell you that she is as an economist and digital expert she's very very cautious very cautious in her words libra was a kick in the butt and her role she sees it as to guide and help the banks navigate especially this central bank digital currency spank space and you know honestly i don't think she's going to be putting xrp into any sdr because when she talks about the reputational risk are just too high to rush uh, she thinks that this space has actually a couple more years to do proof of concepts. And she really wants to find the standards before she moves forward. So I just don't see anything like that XRP SDR anytime soon. I'm not ruling it out as a never never project but when you listen to her and i again i have listened to her on on different occasions and different venues uh she is very 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 cautious and the most interesting of the four people that joined together in this panel is john whelan from santander 
it is very clear to me after I listened to him how complex it is for the banks to decide how to move forward with the digital currencies. You have the commercial bank money that is the money that sits in your account. And then you have the central bank money, which is, you know, the cash coins and reserves. And do you go wholesale or do you go retail or do you do both? And what about the programmability? I mean, think about this. These digital asset assets are um, av available to have contracts put in. It's not just digitizing fiat. It is going one step further, which is really revolutionary. So just imagine you have money in your account that has been programmed to uh, go to, to your family as in an inheritance after you pass away. I mean, the money could be programmed, pre-programmed to do that. And just think of all the pre-programmable possibilities from escrow to, I mean, you name it, it the, the tokenization that can occur with that, that programmable money. It's just really wow. And should it have a, a DLT? drive the technology and if you do do you do it through a centralized version of um, a company a third-party company or do you go DeFi? what about interest bearing should it be interest bearing or should not what about cross-border is it okay how do you handle the aml and the kyc and what about power outages and the risk of double spend you know, this is something that the bank uh, or the governor of the Bahamas really has to deal with. Um, this country has real power outages. So it's just not that easy. It's very complex. And you can see that um, you you can better understand why it'll, it'll, I'm sure happen, but it's going to take a little bit more time. Okay, talking about standards, as Sonia says, she really wants to see. This happened in the last 24 hours, and it's a tweet by Marcus Treacher, and he is the head of customer success, and at Stetis uh, made this handsome card for highlighting the tweet, and it goes like this. Interoperability is key to the future of global payments. As the first member of the ISO 222 standards body focused on DLT, we are committed to supporting the evolving needs of the customers and supporting an industry-wide standard for all. Marcus is one of the three members of the Ripple team that are now part of this ISO 2022 member group of members that are trying to create a global open standard for financial messaging. So what does this all mean? Well, the single standard is important because that will ensure interoperability. And it needs to be interoperable to reduce the inefficiencies. So think of it as speaking the same language. I mean, if you went to a party and you're the only person who speaks English and everyone else is speaking Russian, uh, I think the communication would have a lot of inefficiencies. Well, that's the same for the banking world. So if you go to the XRP Arcade website, this is the website that Leonidas uh, maintains. You can find he's done a really good job at pulling information from the ISO site and from Ripple and uh, adding his own touch that gives you a very informative summary. I don't know if you know, but the ISO, ISO, well, it's best known for its international standards, right, for businesses. And it has more than 22,467 certifications across many, many sectors, health, agriculture, technology, chemicals, uh, medical, yeah, it, and it, it's obvious, I think, that it makes money from its members, but also it makes money from selling the certifications and the sales are sold through third parties. And the price, oh, well, to get a quote, you have to get a quote from an 
accredited certification body. And they're going to ask you, what's the size of your company? How many employees do you want to train? And, oh, you have to get those audits done. So there are a lot of hidden costs. If you are a small organization, the minimum for everything might be $10,000 to $15,000. And if you are one of those accredited bodies that can get it done for everyone you must also have your renewal every four years yeah well anyway if we go to that list one thing is very good is that there are these three ripple team members and they now have a voice and that's very very good absolutely you want to be a part of shaping the standards going forward. So you can see Marcus Treacher, Jeremy Light, and Anthony Ralphs, all part of RippleNet. Interesting, they use the word RippleNet. Okay, so Jeremy Light, I want to talk about him. He first wrote an article for Ripple back in July 2015, and he was at Accenture at that time. He was keeping up a very active blog. I think he really likes to write. And then it was in April 2018. Yeah, so wow, just about three years after that, he joined Ripple and he is now the VP of EU Strategic Accounts. And if you click on his name here, it will take you to his Twitter site. And What's interesting is that you don't see anywhere that he is part of Ripple. He just says he's riding the wave of payments and digital assets, a former management consultant and now fintech independent thinker views expressed are my own. You can go a little bit deeper and you find that he was excited about being a speaker at a um, event in Berlin, was it? Yeah, Berlin, Germany at the Finnovate Europe 2020. And you can find that on his profile, it does say VP of EU Strategic Accounts at Ripple. But if you go to his LinkedIn page, no mention of Ripple. I find it very, very curious that he seems to go under the radar a little bit. He just says that he is the VP of EU Strategic Accounts, a digital asset payments network business. Hmm. All right. Well, Jeremy is doing a lot of writing still, and he writes for Finextra. And one of the best articles that I found in his collection is this one from January 2020, The Digital Asset Boom, a trailer. So he gives us a very, very good article. Jeremy, you're a great writer. I don't think you should go under the radar like this because your work is very insightful. In this article, he compares um, the crypto boom to the uh, dot com boom. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, in many ways, it's very comparable. And you can see that he kind of is comparing it as if we're in a movie and this is the sequel. So let me just read you some of the highlights here. Uh, consequently, bank interest in digital assets is growing, and you sense many may be searching for the right script to commercialize them, and that they are itching to do so. The key element that has held them back in the past is regulatory clarity, but that's changing. It may be only a matter of time before banks feel that they have the green light to build digital asset projects, products, services, and businesses. So now he's going to guess the plot. And I find this really good because he knows this space. We could see a frenzy of activity among banks that could match and possibly exceed their activity in the dot-com boom. Digital assets are about moving value and about liquidity, both sweet spots of the banking sector. The more digital assets are used for storing and moving value, the greater the digital of the greater the value of digital assets networks, with network effects in turn driving up usage and new business models. Banks have a clear commercial incentive to play in these networks. 
banks will build trading desks in digital assets that are huge compared to the digital asset exchanges we see today, supporting the central bank digital currencies, stable coins, and permissionless digital assets such as XRP and Ether. So the scene looks like it may be set for a digital boom for the banking sector and it plays to the strengths of the banking sector and it and is on their own turf banks specialize in different classes of financial assets digital assets are simply a new asset class for them to commercialize and the digital asset boom will be more sustained and commercially viable so-called challengers and neobanks could lead the way and the balance sheet size and liquidity in assets and liabilities will be essential ingredients to any boom so the larger established banks will need to step up for it to happen in which case 2020 or 2021 could be a block could be blockbuster years for adoption of digital assets of all types yeah i like it I like it, Jeremy. Yeah, you should you should highlight uh, more because look, here he is, Jeremy Light, VP uh, Payments FinTech. <laughs> anyway, I think it's a great article and uh, yeah, good work. Okay, everybody, we're jumping to some fluff. So I'm just still always finding the new uh, innovation that is occurring as we have this stay at home directive is just getting more interesting. This is Burger King and they are now doing a deliver, delivery of the Whopper. You get not only the hamburger and the sesame seed buns, but you get all of the ingredients to make your own burger at home. And they even give you this instruction, instruction as to how to assemble everything, which I think is really funny. So you've got the meat here followed by pickles and then the ketchup. And then here is the order of the fresh vegetables followed by the mayonnaise and then the sesame seed bun on top really funny but it's just um yeah it's a little expensive for two burgers is a little bit over ten dollars for four burgers yeah it's like uh it's like twenty dollars us it seems expensive to me but i guess you're getting you're getting the delivery and you and you're getting the ingredients and i guess you're paying for the for the convenience yeah and then we also have a lot of museums now that have gone into the online world and you can tour them virtually. And I wanted to highlight this because the museums that have taken this next step so that you can enjoy it even though they are closed is really great. This is the National Museum of Western Art and then the Tokyo National Museum, the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, the Kyoto Museum of Traditional Crafts, Museum of Oriental Ceramics, Tokugawa Art Museum, the Shohaku Art Museum, Wajima Museum of Urushi Art. Urushi is uh, lacquered, lacquerware, very old traditional craft and most beautiful. And then the Saitama Prefectural Museum of History and Folklore. And the Displays are all different depending on which museum you go to. So this is, I'm at the Saitama one right now. And if you find something here along the bottom that you like to look at, you just click on it and it will bring you in pretty close. Uh, here I can go out as if I'm walking and then I can get up pretty close to the actual glass to look at it. Yeah, I just love it. I'm going to put a link to this down in the description below if you want to look at some of the really good quality museums here in Japan. All right, everybody, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.